Welcome everyone. Hello and welcome everyone. If you missed the morning, welcome. I am Amitav Choudhury, co-director of the Global History Initiative here at Queen's and associate professor of history at Queen's University. And just this morning, I was reflecting on one interesting aspect of COVID conferences. Uh, it is this ability to bring together scholars from all across the world, divided by different time zones, united by Zoom. Zoom has become the quintessential symbol of globality, one of the rare uh, good gifts from a persistent pandemic. Uh, let me begin by thanking the Bernis Nugent Fund and the committee that so faithfully uh, administers the wishes of the endowment for making this event possible. Thanks to Rebecca Manley, Matt Colby, and Bronwyn Jakes for uh, your support for the logistics behind the keynote events. Um, speaking of time zones, we are fortunate to have with us today Professor Candice Fujikani, who is in Hawaii, where it is early morning now, and where I can wager it is not snowing today. Candice, I was just saying in the morning that it's snowing buckets in Kingston. Wow. <laughs> um, we're passing through a snowstorm. Professor Kat Fujikani is a professor of English at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. She is the author of Mapping Abundance for a Planetary Future, Kanaka Maoli, and Critical Settler Cartographies in Hawaii published by Duke University Press last year. In Mapping Abundance, Professor Fujikani asks, how can abundance be mapped to show functioning indigenous economies not premised on the crisis of capital? How are lands mapped as having an ontology of their own, an ontology of life, a will, a desire, and an agency? How can such cartographies help us to grow a decolonial love for lands, seas, and skies that will help to renew abundance on this earth. Um, Professor Fujikani asks, how can um, uh, claims that the cartographies of capital are marked by a process that seizes controls, takes over, and leads to wastelands and disposition? In contrast, native Hawaiian cartographies map the continuities of abundant worlds by weaving in elemental forms. No wastelands there. Through an attunement to the unseen and the sublime, Professor Fujikani shows the way for possibilities of renewed abundance and abundance that removes the very possibility of structural poverty. One reviewer observed, the book breathes with the voices of Hawaiian communities, lands, movements, elements, and Candice Fujikani herself at her best. This book is a spear and a spade, medicine and masterpiece, a diagnosis and a portal. Another reviewer claimed that with ethnographic gracefulness, the book unpacks the perversity of settler capitalism, which produces scarcity in order to claim its toxic surplus. Professor Fujikani is the author of other edited works and numerous articles and chapters on critical settler cartographies, indigenous knowledges and climate change and the colonial and abolitionist futures having earlier received her PhD from UC Berkeley in 1996. Praxis is a part of her research and apart from her prize winning scholarship, she won the Association for Asian American Studies in Gates Scholar Award in 2020 and prize-winning teaching. She won the Chancellor's Citation for Meritorious Teaching in 2004. Professor Fujikani is deeply involved in land struggles against encroaching urban and industrial development in the sacred and storied places in Hawaii. It is this deep commitment to a sustainable future that makes your keynote so exigent in our conference this year. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the conference. Now I will invite Professor Fujikani to present our keynote address entitled Mapping Indigenous Economies of Abundance Against Capitalist Economies of Poverty and Scarcity. Candice, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Amitabha. You just done such a wonderful job of you know, organizing this conference. And I also want to thank Bronwyn for helping out so much uh, with the technical aspects of the, the talk. 
and thanks to the Global History Initiative at Queen's University for just the sponsorship. Um, so it's really wonderful to see your faces. I've been doing a lot of webinars and <laughs> you're the only one talking. So it's really nice to see all of you this morning oh, this morning for me. And uh, I am really looking forward to learning more from each of you and your research. So I'm going to start my PowerPoint. I always, you know, people are curious about Hawaii and so I might as well share uh, what things look like here and um, way beyond the tourist brochures. Um, so. so I'm speaking to you today from Kanaka Maoli land in Heiauli on the island of Oahu, where Kanaka Maoli continue to stand for political independence from US occupation and settler colonialism. I speak as a fourth generation Japanese settler aloha aina. And the term settler aloha aina is a term that Noila Nikujir Kaupua and I talked about uh, for those of us who do not have Kanaka Maoli genealogy, but stand for lands and waters in Hawaii and political independence. So I have this kuleana, this responsibility, uh, because the akua, or what Kumuhula um, master Pulani Kanaka Ole Kanahele translates as elemental forms, these akua or elemental forms has, have physically raised me and they become a part of my body at the molecular level. So that would be the lands of my home in Heiauli. And uh, this is my mountain, Kiahi Akahoi. Uh, and this, my vai uh, is well, my ua, my rain, uh, are the rains of Kaniko'o. And uh, I love Kekuhi. She's my, she's, I'm taking these land stewardship courses from Kekuhi, who's also a master, uh, a master hula, a hula master. And she explains that you cannot restore an island landscape if you don't see yourself as part of that place. Um, and this is my, uh, my kuukai, my salt waters, so kawaho kamano, and it's called um, the mouth of the shark because our reefs are ringed like the the rows of teeth in a shark's mouth. That actually protects us from tsunamis that come from the northeast. So, um, oh, I'm gonna just go back a bit. So I'll just keep that there for a while. So today I want to talk about settler state mapping of poverty onto Kanaka Maoli communities as a way of obscuring the true abundance that they articulate and materialize for themselves in indigenous economies of abundance over and against global capitalist economies of poverty and scarcity, particularly in this era of climate change. So my book, Mapping Abundance for a Planetary Future, Kanaka Maoli and Critical Settler Cartographies in Hawaii begins with a central premise Capital fears abundance. Capital fears abundance. David Lloyd, in his brilliant essay, The Goal of the Revolution is the Elimination of Anxiety on the Right to Abundance in a Time of Artificial Scarcity, has argued that it is precisely the fear of abundance that is inscribed in neoliberal capital. Abundance is both the objective and the limit of capital. The crisis for capital is that abundance raises the possibility of a just redistribution of resources. Lloyd writes, quote, perhaps then we need to recognize that precisely what neoliberal capital fears is abundance and what it implies. Abundance is the end of capital. It is at once what it must aim to produce in order to dominate and control the commodity market and what it designates and what designates the limit that it produces out of its own process. Where abundance does not culminate in a crisis of overproduction, it raises the specter that we might demand a redistribution of resources in the place of enclosure and accumulation by dispossession. The alibi of capital is scarcity. Its myth is that of a primordial scarcity overcome only by labor regulated and disciplined by the private ownership of the means of production. So, um, you know, in this in amazing analysis, you know, he's talking about uh, capital depending on growth through the manufacturing of markets. 
and thus capitalist modes of production manufacture both the perception and the materiality of scarcity to produce hunger. To extend Lloyd's analysis, I argue that while capitalist economies proffer empty promises of imaginary plenitude, ancestral abundance feeds for generations. Writing from a Potawatomi perspective, environmental biologist and poet Robin Wall Kimmerer contends that recognizing true abundance erodes the foundations of capitalist economies. And I'm sorry, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna set my timer so I don't go too much over time, <laughs> which is, you know, always an occupational hazard for somebody in English. <laughs> okay, so um, she contends that recognizing true abundance erodes the foundation of capitalist economies, quote, in consumer society contentment is a radical proposition. Recognizing abundance rather than scarcity undermines an economy that thrives by creating unmet desires, end quote. A kanakamali economy of abundance is one of maona, a fullness or satiation that comes from sharing, trading, gift-giving, conserving, and adapting. Economies of abundance create the conditions for people to see beyond the competition for scarce resources to our own generative capacity to cultivate abundance. Mapping abundance then is a radical act in the face of settler capital's fear of an abundance that feeds. If cartographies of capital are drivers of the wastelanding of the earth, then I argue that mapping abundance strikes at capital where it's most vulnerable by making visible the abundance of indigenous economies and by mapping that abundance. Um, every time we map abundance, we strike at capital. We undo its narrative of inevitability. Mapping abundance is an act of radical refusal of capitalist economies. So as we think about mapping abundance, we can also consider the question of how to get away from rendering the poor or the global South as an abstract category of victimization. So the question is, when faced with conditions of scarcity, how do people choose to articulate the conditions of their existence? Abundance itself is a word um, that grows organically out of indigenous Kanaka Maoli restoration projects in Hawaii, centering the capacity of people to feed themselves. At cultivated fish ponds, at Kalo pond fields, those are the taro terraces, where practitioners assert their capacity to determine their own decolonial futures. This is a manifestation of a decolonial future beyond the settler state, beyond capital, right now in the present. So people aren't waiting for international recognition of Hawaii as an independent nation, but rather people are just working as if it is, you know, just manifesting that kind of uh, decolonization. So Puni Jackson, program director at Holu Aina in Kalihi Valley, explains that so much energy is expended in deficit thinking that strips Kanaka Maoli of agency and reduces them to victims when instead that energy is better spent cultivating an abundant mindedness as the foundation for building an inclusive lahui a broad-based collective of people committed to Kanakamali land-centered governance. So in Hawaii, it's not state-centered governance, it's land-centered governance. So she explains, quote, because as a Lahui, we need healing, all of us need healing, and it's easy to come to a sort of deficit-mindedness of nomonaf, or putting Hawaiians, or we got all of this taken away. But in the end, we have each other, we have this Aina, the lands and the seas. We have our babies. We have the heritage of our kupuna, the elders or the ancestors, that we are overwhelmingly blessed with. And so I hope to perpetuate that abundant mindedness that I was raised with. So today I want to start by sketching out the rhetorical regimes and tactics of capital to represent abundant lands as wastelands so that it can seize control of the means of production. And so I'll start by outlining what I refer to as capital's mathematics of subdivision. 
which is an iteration of enclosure, used to condemn lands that are then seized by capital. I want to then shift the discussion to the ways that Kanaka Maoli have worked to reclaim ike kupuna or ancestral knowledge. And I, I think you'll see a real shift in the language um, that I'm using in these two different sections. I look to the embodied practice of organizing huaka'i or spiritual, spiritual journeys on political bus tours across the lands as a way of sharing the stories of wonder about the akua, the elemental forms on the land and transforming wonder into aloha aina, a profound love for land, seas, and skies. Aloha aina is what channels wonder into direct action as bus riders learn how they can stand for lands and waters both within settler state governing structures and beyond them. I end by considering the ways that practitioners are now teaching courses in land stewardship where we are taught the names of the akua, the elemental forms, their natural laws, and how to abide by the natural laws that supersede the profit-driven laws of humans. So how do we as academics and activists work against these late liberal settler capitalist operations that continue to produce the conditions of poverty? So in my own work, I realized that as a settler, aloha aina, as a scholar activist, I could use my research and rhetorical training to present testimony to protect lands and waters in Hawaii. I have read through literally thousands of pages of environmental impact statements, cultural impact assessments, archaeological inventory surveys, hydrological studies, and legislative bills. For the past eight years, I have been slowly learning the beautiful intricacies and profound depth of Olelo Hawaii, or the Hawaiian language, to learn to think and write in Kanaka Maoli metaphors to attend to the embodied theories that emerge organically from communities of practitioners. In 2010, I joined the struggles in Waianae that I'm gonna talk about today to protect the birthplace of Maui and agricultural lands from the development of a light industrial park. And in 2012, I joined the struggles to protect the sacred mountain, Mauna Awakea from the proposed construction of the 30 meter telescope, which is really an industrial complex. I have testified in toxic juridical settler state spaces to protect lands and waters. I have served both as a legal observer and I've stood on the front lines facing police officers armed with tear gas and sound cannons. And it is the wonder of ancestral knowledges and aloha aina that sustains all of us in this work. Um, I also join in the protocols of the lahui. I give my aloha to the akua and the aina by offering the ho'okupu or the offering of my breath in pule, prayer, my hands and body on Saturday work days in taro pond fields and fish ponds. And I also uh, offer the kaniko'o rains of my home in Hea Uli, whom I collect for the ahu or the altars of other places. All of these practices honor and love the kupuna, the elders, the ancestors, who are not mine genealogically, but are the ancestors of this place where I live. And this means sharing in the decolonial joy too, the wonder of these experiences that grows in us a desire to return to this work again and again, because that work is really toxic. Fighting the settler state is incredibly toxic. And you need that kind of spiritual side uh, to continue in that struggle. Because when necessary, I have been arrested. And my father taught me that it's necessarily, necessary to challenge the law when it's unjust. And uh, I'm not fetishizing arrests. But when we see Native peoples who, and other people who live in economically depressed communities who face environmental racism on the front lines, and when those people are getting arrested multiple times, then those of us who can afford to get arrested can step in to help shoulder the burden of arrests. So in those cases, we stand to hold space for those who cannot afford to be arrested. And you know, we're always terribly grateful to the attorneys who pro bono 
work on our cases. Uh, they really are what allow us to take the risks that we do. So I hold myself to a higher standard than to human laws. I hold myself accountable to the laws of the elements which supersede the laws of humans. And as I'll discuss in the, at the conclusion of the paper, Kanakamali have discerned the laws of the elements through the art of kilo, keen intergenerational observation of the natural world, tracking anomalies in order to assess, adapt, and activate both the natural world and ourselves. Okay, so um, rather than, okay, so I guess another important point that I want you to keep in mind as I'm speaking is that this all has to do with climate change. And rather than seeing global climate change as leading to the demise, oh, I'm sorry, rather than seeing global climate change as apocalyptic, we can see it as leading to the demise of settler capitalist economies of scarcity. Uh, making way for indigenous economies of abundance. So it is, um, it is not the end of humankind. It's the end of perhaps capitalist humankind. <laughs> uh, and that means that we all have to kind of work on our addiction to capital, right? <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna uh, go to this next image. Um, this is in Waianae, where the struggle uh, that I'm talking about takes place. So Pu'uheleakala, the great hill where the supernatural being Maui ensnared the sun, rises up in Waianae in massive ridged brown columns above the Kula Pili, the yellow grassy plains below. When I look at it, I imagine Maui lassoing the Kukunaokala the rays of the sun, his muscles straining as he struggles to break them to slow the sun's traversal across the sky. Maui sought to lengthen the days so that kalo farmers could tend to their lo'ikalo, their tar taro pond fields, and his mother Hina could dry her kapa, cloth beaten from the bark of the voke or the paper mulberry. The land shimmers with the heat of the sun that has teeth in lua lua le the sun that bites my feet. Below, behind me winds Ulehava stream. As I stand gazing at this great hill, the clouds pass across intensely blue skies and the shadow in the crevice where the columns meet darkens and pulses. The ridges curve, uh, sharpen into view as the thighs of Hina and the shadow above as the ma'i that birthed Maui. In this mapping of the mo'olelo, the waters of Ulehava appear as birth waters rushing out into the sea where Maui would later try to fish up the islands with his fish hook, Manaya Kalani. The Maui stories of wonder are particularly important along the Waianae coast that have been depicted in the media as arid wastelands, both geographically and culturally, racialized as Hawaiian places of poverty, houselessness, substance abuse, and violence, despite the abundance grown by Waianae farms and the vai vai, or the wealth of Kanaka Maoli in their familial relationships and ancestral knowledges and practices. Now the word vai vai, vai is water, so vai vai, the reduplication means wealth. Um, so Waianae is also a distinctively Hawaiian place because Hawaiian homestead lands were established there by the occupying state, thereby moving Kanaka Maoli away from the increasingly lucrative land markets in the metropole of Honolulu and the tourist-driven economy of Waikiki. Settler colonial regional planning has led to a proliferation of environmental injustice hotspots that have had devastating effects on Kanaka Maoli and others living in Waianae who consequently suffer from the highest rates of health problems, including cancer and respiratory diseases. But what settler colonial structures have created poverty in Waianae? So this is a registered map 2372 of the Forest Reserve in Waianae Valley, Waianae Kai, Oahu, 
drawn in 1906 by surveyor M.D. Montserrat, uh, and it bears witness to the persistent historical trace that can never be fully erased. It tells the story of the corporate diversion of water by ranches and sugar plantations that desiccated taro pond fields and forced them fallow. Thousands of Kanakamali farmers were displaced by these water diversions and forced to seek livelihoods in the industrial centers of the islands away from their ancestral lands. So what this map shows is that in Waianae Valley alone, there were 280 acres of lands that you see here saying formerly in taro, formerly in taro, formerly in taro. And it shows us that there are 16 water tunnel diversions and you can see, uh, let me see, I almost have a, see the tunnels here, tunnel, tunnel, tunnel. These are all diverting the waters from 28 springs. The 1893 overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom government and the subsequent US occupation of Hawaii and its, and its operations of settler colonialism made possible the twin seizures of land and water. So there was, there was once, 50,000 acres in wetland kalo and even more in dryland kalo cultivation. Today, there are 400 acres in cultivation. So the dramatic decline in traditional kalo farming and the capacity of Kanakamali to feed themselves because of this corporate diversion of water is the visible sign of the effects of settler colonialism. So settler colonialism uh, takes from us our capacity to feed ourselves um, in order to control the means of production. So I want to point to the usefulness. So ironically, this map has been incredibly useful. So um, when um, Butch Detroit from the Kaala, uh, Kaala Farms explains that this map also helped people to restore water to the ancient taro terraces, so when the youth group at Ka'ala Farms discovered that ancient stone walls of taro pond fields were still standing, they began to restore the taro terraces. They began to grow their own food. And they used a long pipe to use water from the concrete diversion set up by the ranch. The settler state said that they were illegally diverting the water. But they used this map to show that Ka'ala Farms is located on lands marked formerly in taro. So they were able to argue that they were restoring water and not diverting it. Uh, I, I love that story when you can use settler colonial maps against the state, the settler state. <laughs> okay, so um, I want to show, oh, and this is, this is actually the marginalia and there's so much to learn from marginalia. It actually documents um, from the map, a, a concise uh, accounting for the 289 acres formerly in Taro, 26 springs and 16 tunnels. So I want to turn now to a particular struggle in White and I that illustrates the power of community organizing for abundance. So in fall 2010, White and I communities were locked in a struggle with developers to protect 96 acres of conservation land, also known as the birthplace of Maui, from being developed into a light industrial park. So this is uh, the purple spot. The, that area became known as the purple spots. You can see how the purple spot represents the developer's desire for an urban zone in the middle of a green district zone for agricultural and conservation lands. Yet, as I read through the environmental impact statement prepared by the developer, Tropic Land L the LLC, I could not recognize Lua Lua Lay in their descriptions. Where the developer characterized the land as a wasteland, I saw neighboring truck farms with vast green fields of manoa lettuce, basil, and green onions. And um, so this is what the project site looked like. And this is what the farmlands in the vicinity looked like. So we had to make a map like this for the Land Use Commission. And this is incomplete. This is only the farmers that we got to talk to, um, showing them that this is not a wasteland. It's actually a more effective way of farming. These are uh, two acre truck farms, much more effective than uh, corporate farming, which in Hawaii has led to um, huge legal battles uh, and the, the indict, indicting of um, 
uh, farm owners who have contracted, uh, have illegally uh, trafficked um, workers from Thailand to work on their industrial farms in Hawaii. So, um, but this is what the developer sees, right? The developer desiccated the living land through stark line drawings, paralyzed in time, two-dimensional documents that abstract, compartmentalize, and encode the intimacies of land into a parcel and a project area, into lines, dots, grids, letters, and numbers, into state-regulated tax map keys, zoning codes, soils classifications, and productivity ratings. I see these conditions of cartographic depletion replicated again and again in Hawaii and in other indigenous spaces in the world the corporate manufacturing of wastelands exhausted through exhausted settler colonial cartographies. As we've witnessed over and over again, developers deploy what I refer to as a settler colonial mathematics of subdivision, cartographies that dismember land into smaller and smaller pieces, isolated from one another to the point where each fragment uh, is according to the occupying state, no longer agriculturally feasible, culturally significant, or is small enough to be given a token easement that can then be built around. This diminishing of land is part of the larger project of the occupying state that must repeatedly compulsively seize land through a piecemeal process precisely because it never completely captures the occupied territory. And there is always the poss possibility that the territory will escape its grasp. In the process, entire ecological systems have become fractured, creating a devastating cycle whereby the cartographic fracturing of ecological system, uh, systems actually produces wastelands. So here are some examples of, Um, of this uh, mathematics of subdivision um, used to get approval for projects in Hawaii. Um, and these are uh, for particularly dangerous and um, harmful projects that threaten culturally sensitive areas. So one would be phased archeological inventory surveys. So this is what they're doing for the rail that they're currently building in Honolulu. They are doing archeological surveys as the rail is being built. So before they start construction, they assess the area immediately in front of the, um, the construction site. So if they find something, they argue that, oh, but we've already spent so much money. We have to continue the route of the rail, right? Who, that doesn't make sense. Why would you do phased archeological inventory surveys? But that has been approved by the state legislature. Uh, second, urban spot zoning. This is very common. So what it is, is you would have a green agriculture or conservation area, and the purple area that marks industrial or urban use uh, is planted in the middle. And um, in this case, it's a, really, it's a really frustrating process that they use to do this. So um, for, for some unimaginable reason, landfills are considered an agricultural use, but they are also an industrial use. So what developers do is they put a landfill in, in an agricultural area uh, and they say that it's permitted by, uh, because it's an agricultural use. Uh, and then they say, they put, in, they, they put in a proposal for a development of a industrial project and they say, my use is consistent with the use at this landfill. And that's how they get urban spot zoning approved. Um, and it's very much like a cancer it spreads throughout an agricultural area. So in Hawaii, we import 90% of our food. You would think, right? We are the best place to grow food. We have, uh, we, we, we barely have seasons. We have the rainy season and the hot season. <laughs> and yet uh, we have to import 90% of our food. Um, and then this third one um, is the, uh, this involves the way that individual sites are recognized in isolation from the other um, sites that comprise uh, uh, an entire district or a complex. So this is um, distributional archaeology actually calls for examining sites in relation to each other in, in the form of a complex. But what um, they're doing on Mauna Wakea is to um, ignore 
that this is the project's uh, site, they call it, for the TMT Observatory. They ignore the fact that it's in the middle of 263 altars, ahu, and shrines, clearly marking the area as sacred. Uh, this is the uh, one that I'm talking about today. The fourth uh, example would be the isolation of the project area by, by the boundary lines. So you see there are two projects here. The blue area, this one, very thorough cultural impact assessment, 150 pages. And this area in the red, uh, the cultural impact assessment is 10 pages. And they argue that they stopped within the boundary lines and therefore uh, they were able to come up with such a, a ridiculous uh, cultural impact assessment. So anyway, that would be uh, the problem with um, boundary lines in the same way that you know individual sites are not recognized as complexes. Okay, so um, I'm sorry, let me just kind of Oh, sorry, here we go. So let me see. Sorry, I'm just kind of organizing my sheets here. I always have a problem with orienting the, the paper in relation to um, the screen. Okay. So uh Okay, so the, in this particular case, again, the developer had to petition the Land Use Commission for a boundary amendment that would rezone his conservation land for urban use. And so um, this, I'm going to show you this image. In one particularly emblematic cartographic moment that encapsulates the mathematics of subdivision, the, developer, the developer's attorney swept into the Land Use Commission hearing room very dramatically with an orange five gallon bucket of dirt, which he entered as petitioner's exhibit 67. During his cross-examination of a planner from the Hawaii Department of Agriculture, the attorney gestured toward the bucket of dirt and said, uh, asked, do you consider land that contains rocks of this size to be good farmland. The attorney was trying to establish that the stoniness of the land supports the conclusion in the environmental impact statement that agricultural act activity on the property is not sustainable. So this iconic moment visually enacts the slide of rhetoric by which developers reduce land down to a bucket of dirt in an all too familiar allegory for a cartography of settler capital. The attorney sought to assert the self-evidence of the dirt, its capacity to represent only itself. In this moment, the attorney reduced lands in their to their molecular state, to dirt held in suspension, isolated away from the histories, material practices, and the people of the place from which the dirt was taken. In this way, life is endlessly subdivided and subtracted. The mathematics of subdivision eviscerates lands, renders them void of meaning in the manufacturing of terra nullius, lands belonging to no one, erasing 20 years of farming on that land. The dirt was instead to represent land in its most abjected state. And in this way, um, developers map lands as buckets of dirt with geological core samples, uh, committing forms of epistemic and material violence to lands in the people's Sustain. In the most stunning of ironies, however, the attorney chose to represent the unworthiness of the land with a stone, not knowing that in the national anti-annexation song of protest, Mele Ai Pohaku, or the stone eating song, stones are ka'ai kamaha'o ka'aina, the astonishing food of the land that sustains Kanaka physically and spiritually. So this uh, was at um, our, our stand at Mauna Wakea to protect the sacred mountain. Ualawa mako ikapo haku means we are satisfied with the stones. <laughs> so I was like, oh, dude, do you even know <laughs> what you're saying when you're saying that the worthlessness of this land is represented by a stone? <laughs> okay, so, um, so huaka'i. So as the occupying state and developers represent wondrous lands as wastelands to pave the way for urban and industrial development, exacerbating conditions of poverty, kupuna and cultural practitioners are currently 
building a broad widespread movement to map abundance through mobilizing huaka'i aloha aina to protect storied and sacred lands from overdevelopment. So huaka'i again, you know, our spiritual journeys. On these huaka'i, Kanaka Maoli are engaging in the traditional practice of ka'apuni ma ka'ika'i, sightseeing tours taken as occasions to view, remember, and teach the mo'olelo the storied histories of the akua, um, the elemental forms, the kupua, the supernatural beings, and the ali'i, the chiefs, and the people of these places. Mo'olelo are part of the radical resurgence of Kanakamali ways of knowing, along with the critical decolonial effects they create as they illustrate what the occupying state designates as wastelands are actually aina momona, or fat and fertile lands, and aina kamaha'o, wondrous lands. Growing aloha aina has the doubled meaning of growing love for the lands and waters, as well as growing the people who are the patriots who sustain a love for the aina and Hawaiian political independence. So huaka'i has become a foundational strategy in Kanaka Maoli work against capital, remapping the developers, um, what developers label as wastelands by inviting decision makers and their administrative assistants to travel across the land and experience the wonder of land for themselves. So the Huaka'i Kako Ono Waianai Environmental Justice Bus Tour was organized by the concerned elders of Waianai. Um, and Kahea, the Hawaiian Environmental Alliance, and um, the American Friends Service Committee, Hawaii chapter. The bus tour was designed to help people from Waianae and beyond to testify at the upcoming Land Use Commission hearings. Political mobilizing has its own cascading effects as speakers on the bus tour map out the conditions of occupation um, and the environmental justice, injustice hotspots in Waianae. They not only educate, but enlist the aid of activists from other social and political movements. Supporters are called multipliers who take the knowledge that they gain back to their home communities to share struggles uh, in a broader base of support for each other. And the organizers for this bus tour were inspired by political bus tours in Oakland, California that pointed to the economic disparities between black and white communities. Uh, political tours of the West Bank have reached out to activists and educators um, and many US academics have been on the tours of the West Bank as well as black taxi tourists uh, tours in Belfast. So I, I've been on that one and that was amazing. Uh, we visited the Sinn, uh, Sinn Féin uh, bookstore and we heard the stories of the people who worked at the bookstore. Uh, similarly on Huaka'i, the Kupuna and Wa'enai are very clear about their strategy to invite others into their struggles and to ask them to take on the kuleana or the, the responsibility or the privilege of testifying to protect these places. So the first bus tour was organized in 2009 and it continues today. I have become uh, one of the speakers on the bus tour uh, and, and the bus tour takes writers along a roadmap of the concerned elders activism. And it features these three women who are amazing Kanaka Maoli women, members of the concerned elders of White and I. And they stop along the way to invite farmers in the neighborhoods to step on board the bus to share the stories of their multiple displacements by capital, by development projects. So Walter B. Aldeguer recounts stories of her childhood and the storied histories of Lua Lua Le. She's the mo'olelo person, the one who talks about the, um, the kumulipo, the genealogical chant that traces all life um, back to its beginnings in Po, the ancestral realm. Um, Alice Kaholo Greenwood speaks about social justice and her advocacy for um, homeless or houseless people of White and I. And Lucy Gay describes environmental injustices and community organizing. Oh, and just a quick thing, Lucy, Alice is just amazing. She actually got the Hawaii State bus system to recognize homeless encampments as communities. So uh, school buses can stop at homeless encampments uh, to take the children to school. So all three of their voices move in and out of the narrative to haku or weave together their accounts of community organizing, along with their analyses of the political and the corporate forces they stand against, all bound together by the wonders of the gifts that Maui shared with the people. 
So as they share traditional mo'olelo about Maui, they also weave their own stories and histories into that um, mo'olelo so that we can see a lay that twists together the strands of the past and the present from the action of the supernatural beings, the elemental forms, and the people and their descendants struggle um, against environmental injustices today. Okay, so here's a map of the bus tour. Uh, how, this is the, the route of the bus tour. And um, it, it, it's an amazing um, two hour tour. They speak, the elders speak of the ways the lands of Lualuale are hollowed out by the extraction of limestone used to, uh, for cement to build hotels in Waikiki. Then the holes in the earth are later used as construction and demolition landfills for the dumping of toxic wastes. So they are twice hit by, uh, by capital. Toxic dust carried on the Kayaulu winds uh, fly to nearby Hawaiian homesteads, houses and schools that have led to the highest rates of, again, respiratory diseases and lung cancer. Um, they describe the seizure of lands by the military intended for Hawaiian homesteads. So Hawaiian homesteads were intended to allow um, Hawaiians to um, have two acre farms so that they could um, feed themselves. But that land was seized by the military and 78,000 tons of explosives are housed at the Lua Lua Le Naval Magazine. So along the way, they describe um, their own activism. So as they fight back, they photograph illegal activities and file complaints with state agencies. They have won a $1.3 million settlement where they reported that the city and county of Honolulu itself was illegally dumping concrete in their streams. Um, so they often have to go to the Department of Health. Um, and they, you know, they're all retired. So that is the thing. Uh, you know, people living in a capitalist economy rely on money and they, they have two constraints, money and time. Um, the retired elders, they have time. They don't have money, but they have time. So they sit and they take photographs. They have their binoculars and they go with their canes to actually confront these um, people who are, you know, illegally dumping toxic waste in their neighborhoods. They're just amazing uh, and just inspiring. Um, they stopped the dumping of coal bottom ash at the quarry, the limestone quarry, where they showed how the waters in the quarry cells were rising and falling with the tide, showing how the bottom ash was being carried out through porous caves and tunnels of limestone out to the sea. And they also stopped at the site of the purple spot to show people what is happening there and to encourage people to come out to testify to protect that land and to protect, to, to, to protect all lands and waters in Hawaii. Um, and so um, there are other struggles that they describe um, and I'm just gonna show you. They also do this thing, like they're such a tight community that they actually have access to historical photographs. So this is the land that the developer claims is agriculturally unfeasible. So they have these 1968 photographs um, of their family members working on the farm. Uh, and actually the fun part of this was um, you have to find fun somehow. Whenever the developer would, you know, <laughs> announce in a very pompous way, the lands are agriculturally unfeasible. I, I was manning the, I was womaning the projector and I would flash to these images behind him. So he would say, the lands are agriculturally unfeasible and then there'd be these uh, farm, uh, the workers harvesting in the background. So he was very annoyed with me. Um, and so these are, this is uh, Oyen Kanashiro. He's one of the farmers who talks on the bus tour and he describes his, um, his mano lettuce fields. Okay, so um, just checking where I am at time, sorry. If, this is the only thing about um, being on, being on uh, Zoom is that um, there's so many devices going on at the same time. Okay, so um, to help the bus riders, oh, sorry, sorry, oh. Oh, oh, I don't know what that was, okay. To help the bus riders understand what is at stake for the kupuna and families in the struggle, Walter B. shares a Kanaka Maoli cartography in motion that tells the story of Maui's birth along the ridgeline of Pu'uheleakala and Palikea. So this is um, the story uh, of his birth in the 15th Vau or era of the Kumulipo. So Maui is born as a, a an egg. Uh, he's birthed as an egg. So this is the dome of Pu'uheleakala. And this tells the story, Hanao Maui Akamalo, o Kamalo Akalana Yukumea. And it um, describes the birth of the egg 
um, and the hatching of the chick and you drive along Farrington Highway much as in the past you would have uh, paddled a canoe across the landscape and you see the birthing of Maui. And here you see Maui as a chicken with his waddle and uh, the full outline of Maui that you see the composite silhouette of the mountain. And this is Maui as a handsome man. You see, this is his brow and his nose and his chin. Yeah. So um, this birthing reminds uh, the people of Waianae that they have this history and the wonder of the story uh, that I explain in greater detail in my book is that Maui uh, raised up the islands from the ocean floor uh, in order to connect them. He wanted the, there to be no seas uh, so that people could walk from island to island. And that became, a, a, for me, a fundamental illustration of mo'o aina, the integrity of the land. The land is one papa, one foundation. So that um, developers, when they try to parcel out the land, when they try to fragment the land and slice it up and carve it into smaller and smaller pieces, this uh, concept of mo'o aina is one that conveys a Hawaiian worldview where the land is all connected so that a harmful event in one area will ripple out to all others. But by the same token, a restorative effect can also ripple out to all others. And the idea of mo'o aina uh, is something I can talk more about, but that has become a, a central kind of way of conceptualizing um, the protection of lands and waters in Hawaii. Okay, and I'm going to move on here to the story. So this is um, how Kanaka Maoli see um, the Maui stories that Walter B. describes on the bus tour. This is a mural at the um, Pu'uheleakala Head Start Preschool. So children grow up learning about Maui's gifts. And here you see the ecological uh, interconnectedness of the lands in the mountains down to the lands um, at the shoreline. And that again, another in, uh, kind of a reinforcement of the conception of the integrity of land, that the ecological system um, is also a hydrological system. The rains in the mountains carry the flowers down to the seas and they create estuaries um, that are important nurseries for the baby fish. And so this kind of understanding of water, because the, the water, uh, the Commission on Water Resources Management for a long time and still today continues to argue that their, um, their steward, their management of water ends at the shoreline. But no, actually, it should end at the outer edge of the reef, which is where Ahupua'a, the traditional land division, ended because freshwater streams are so important to estuaries and actually to protecting the islands from hurricanes. It creates a cold water barrier around the islands. Um, so when hurricanes come barreling over the warm waters of the Pacific, they either veer north or south because uh, the cold waters um, move the hurricanes away from us. So um, this, the Huaka'i ends with a uh, Ma'o organic farm. And this is um, an example of, uh, you know, the ways that Kanaka Maoli have returned to indigenous knowledges, um, thinking about farming, um, when the developer's environmental impact statement describes the soil as unsuitable for cultivation at Ma'o Organic Farms, which is adjacent to the purple spot, Ma'o Organic Farm Manager uh, Kamuela, Kamuela Inos describes the fertility of Lua Lua Le Vertisol soils, A and B rated soils of highest productivity. So this is, you know, the kind of illustration that the developer was trying to use in this case saying that, well, you see all the lands, they're all E63 lands, E14, E105, E is the lowest quality lands for cultivation. But he failed to point to the fact that this I in this see this is actually where Araki's farm was in cultivation. This is the purple spot. And you can see how agriculturally productive it was. I represents irrigation. So when irrigated, E lands become B lands. But the developer was trying to show, and, and I think this is key to other um, problems of, you know, where environmental impact statements are used against um, communities. 
is that uh, when irrigated, the lands become incredibly productive. But they were trying to point to unirrigated land as being non-productive, of course. <laughs> okay, um, so um, he argues that the surface of the gray uh, clay soil cracks in the heat of the sun, turns over, and tills itself. And so the young people of Wai and I learned that Lua Lua Leu vertisol soil is among the richest soils for planting in the world, as evidenced by the abundance of fruits and vegetables, ma'o supplies to high-end restaurants, in addition to its community-supported agricultural program. Um, and ma'o Organic Farms has developed a two-year youth leadership training camp and internship program. Um, it funds, they fund their education at the University of Hawaii or in the community colleges, um, in training them to become, uh, you know, managers in a technical sense. Right? So in 2012, we won this battle against the developer, um, but it was not on the cultural basis that we argued. It was on the tech, sorry, technicality, um, the technicality of there not being a, a, a the, the the um, developer did not own the only road leading to the property. It was owned by the US military. And it was on that technicality that the uh, petition for rezoning was um, denied. But the important point is that it was an educational project way beyond just this one case. It taught people how to organize. It taught the young people the importance of the stories in organizing, the importance of um, understanding and representing um, the Akua of these places. And years later, uh, today, Ma'o Organic Farms, because they, the, because the developer failed to get the petition, uh, failed to get their um, rezoning, uh, Ma'o Organic Farms bought that land and is now farming that land. So it is really a beautiful story of the success. Um, I want to quickly kind of move to um, the broader ways in which um, Kanaka Maoli in Hawaii are working to um, are working to work with the akua or the elements. And um, so one of the things I'm working with um, and, and focusing a little bit now in my new book, Elemental Cartographies, are um, the ways that they um, Kanaka Maoli map the akua. So um, Noila Nipuniba is a Hawaiian studies professor specializing in natural resources management. And she argues, if you know your akua, if you are pili to your akua, if you have aloha for your akua and understand their functions, you will know how to work with them and how to respond to them. We too must change. We have to adapt to the elements. The first adaptation is to know who the akua are. The akua are different on each island and we have to know the akua of our places. When we know our akua, we can call their names and activate them and ourselves. So at the um, Edith Kanaka Ole Foundation, um, they, I start, they've, they've identified many of the akua as natural processes and um, as uh, elemental energetics. So hina lua ikoa, hina who vomits uh, or produces coral is this natural process of coral spawning. And so they've honed in, they, they've relied on looking to mele uh, songs and oli chants that uh, to look at knowledge over a span of time, the, cha the changes happening to the coral in this kind of way. And in all of this, what is important is the pilina or the relationship between people and the elements, between the elements and also um, between people, right? Um, so uh, let's see, so there are 400,000 akua. Laka is really cool as the, um, the deity of evapotranspiration. And so they track the hydrological cycle. They knew uh, before the scientists at Mauna Kea that the primary source of water on Mauna Kea is fog drip. It is not rain or snow, it is fog drip. And they had a name, they have a name, Kalawa Kolea is the deity of fog drip. Okay, um, and in their plan for um, true island stewardship, they've divided the land into 21 vow or horizontal realms of island stewardship. And they've determined that there are um, many different kanawai or laws uh, 
in stewarding these areas. One is the whole kiki kind of line or the edict of continuum, uh, which is that water should flow unobstructed. So no diversions of water. Yeah. No, um, no crazy ideas about trying to dynamite lava to change the path of a lava flow. Uh, that has been a serious consideration. Yes, yeah, people are like really crazy sometimes in Hawaii. <laughs> like, where do you come up with these ideas? Um, okay, and uh, Ho'okiki Kanawai, uh, Kiho'i Ho'i Kanawai is the edict of regeneration. So looking very carefully at what is necessary for regeneration. Oh, and I, this is the image for what I mentioned earlier, the relationship between Kane, the freshwater stream flows and springs, and the flows uh, uh, of Kanaloa, the ocean, the deep consciousness of the ocean, they are two akua who walk the lands looking for ava, which is a kind of a ceremonial drink. They look for the ava plant and the water, they create springs, um, but they also, their relationship actually protects Hawaii from hurricanes that pass north or south of us. And um, again, I wanna talk about the problem in uh, of scalar, uh, un the unreliability of scalability, people think that the only way to stop climate change is to get the major corporations, global corporations involved or to get states involved, but really it's the local efforts that are really important in effecting a kind of ripple effect in terms of our consciousness and our thinking and the materiality uh, of regeneration. So this is a very small spring, it's like uh, 12 inches across, very tiny, um, and this is how uh, this is how um, uh, deceptive scale is. It actually feeds this lo'ikalo, which can feed, uh, I don't know, many families from just this. This is a wild lo'i. Uh, it's wild in the sense that um, they, they, they started the lo'i and then now it grows on its own. So they would say that that is grown in the wawakua by the hands of the elements. Um, okay, and so um, I just wanted to end with that thought is that, um, again, a small devastating increase like one degree temperature in Celsius can cause the melting of glaciers um, and sea level rise and the acidification of the ocean, but um, a small restorative action can ripple out to have unexpected event. So this would be, this is limu, edible seaweed. And it's just sometimes, you know, it just, there's like, what caused this incredible abundance, you know? And um, I, if you talk to a practitioner, they would be able to explain the conditions that led to this particular abundance. In some of the mo'olelo, you hear stories about the limu, the seaweed being three feet high in abundance, piles of limu three feet high. Uh, this to me, I've never seen this before. Um, and a friend posted this uh, on Facebook and I thought, oh, what a beautiful image of abundance. So um, I'm just gonna stop there. And um, thanks so much for, um, for staying with me. <laughs> I, I, and I, I welcome questions. Please ask me very hard questions, hard, hard questions. <laughs> Thank you so much, Candice, for uh, bringing your empirical research uh, and combining that with uh, philosophical and literary reflections guided by a sense of praxis, praxis of activism. Really appreciate the talk. Uh, I, we have time. We have, we have a good amount of time for questions. And I think uh, we want to take one question and then have uh, you respond to that instead of collecting all the questions at the same time. And I'll take... Uh, liberty of asking the first question since I have the microphone before passing this on to others. And I was thinking as you're speaking quite a few striking things that capital fears abundance, that we should imagine a post-capitalist world um, that climate change could bring about. Okay. And I have been thinking about the divisions that capital has wrought, the demarcations, the shrinkages, the territorial divisions that are designed to enrich a few at the expense of the most. Okay. However, indigenous societies, Kanaka Maori, are not devoid of hierarchies as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I wonder about abundance in the face of hierarchy, in the face of already existing division. And uh, how, how can we, 
how can you respond to that, that divisions are not going to go away. Hierarchies are structurally present, no matter which society we are looking at. Mm -hmm. And therefore the abundance that we are imagining, how does it, how do we put it into practice? That's a, that's a really great question. It's a million dollar question. There's so much, um, you know, because uh, there's only so much people do struggle for yeah, domination. <laughs> okay, within Kanakamali communities, however, okay, so there's, um, there are Kanakamali who support the settler state, um, who uh, work or believe in, say, the state's promise of a nation within a nation. Uh, and that's, there's a Office of Hawaiian Affairs, which is the state arm of um, what uh, some people think of as self-determination. So there are people who work for the state. Um, let's look at a concrete example like Mauna Kea. So in Mauna Kea, definitely there are people who support the construction of the telescope. But if we look to what happened at the Mauna um, in 2019, when um, there were 8,000 people going to the Mauna to protect it, uh, to learn through the educational workshops they were having there. 8,000 people would go there daily. They were able to feed 8,000 people through food that was donated by um, the larger community. Yeah? Um, some of it actually was funded by some of the state agencies, um, there is that, but much of it was brought in like people and these are, you know, of course, people who are working class are the most generous people, right? Um, so they were cooking food and they were bringing food up to the Mauna. I was up there for the first two weeks and it was just incredible to see people dropping off food, um, whatever they had, whatever they had growing in their yard, uh, whatever they could cook and bring up. And they were able to feed 8,000 people. There was actually um, one man who owned a, Porta potty company, uh, Hawaii Johns, and he actually provided the porta porta potties for the Mauna. That actually turned out to be the most crucial element was um, having a place to so that we wouldn't continue the devastation of the lands there. Um, having the porta potties there, um, so it was a hard struggle. And how they organized it was they had um, the kupuna or the elders. Um, as part of the governing structure. Um, it was very loose. There was not, um, you know, there was not a leader, but the kupuna, the elders, took on that um, responsibility to um, have the kind of final say in the decision-making process. Now, the difference between um, what was happening at, they call it the pu'u, pu'u honua or pu'u hulu hulu, is that it was based around um, food production. So that is described traditionally as a kauhale system. So everything rotated around the food tent um, and the kupuna even had their own um, separate mini food tent in their area because they were stationed. The kupuna said that they would stand, the elders would stand in the roadway. So their tent was built on the roadway to Mauna Kea. Um, so having the elders there as a kind of um, you know, a kind of a, a, a decision-making body was, I think, the key part of gaining uh, the people's support for the decision-making process. Then the other groups that um, were part of that process were the ones who helped sustain the food, like the people who worked in the kitchen, uh, the people who um, were building the solar generators um, for the project, uh, for, the, for the people there. And of course, it's, it was difficult, you know, there were times where people did not agree. Should people be evicted if they were not behaving, you know, like people were, oh, well, people, you know, anyone who was caught drinking or doing drugs or smoking pot was immediately asked to leave, you know, there was that kind of a structure. It is not easy. They were up there for eight months uh, without formal, um, you know, financial support, whatever came in was through donations. Uh, but they were able to sustain that. And what it did was it gave people a vision of possibility, what, the, what, what, what a future uh, where people willingly gave their labor, um, not because they were being paid, but because they believed in what 
was happening. Um, I think that that was inspiring for a lot of people. And of course, that's not without the kinks of, you know, how to sustain that for a longer period of time. But you could see how hungry young people were for that kind of, um, that kind of arrangement of life, that it offered them an alternative to um, the settler state. And I think that um, uh, we don't always know what um, things look like. I, I've heard people use the uh, a kind of um, um, analogy of childbirth. You don't know what your child's going to look like, but you're invested in his or her future. <laughs> you know, uh, you love that child. So, you know, it's not fully articulated, but it's unfold an unfolding process. Um, and you're right, there, there will be divisions and there continue to be divisions, but some of them have been very generative and productive. For example, questions about the role of um, queer uh, folks up at the Mauna, what is their role in the decision-making process? Um, that has come up. Um, what is the role of the alliances uh, of Kanaka Maoli with um, blacks, black activists active in the Black Lives Matter movement? That has been actually a very productive um, space for conversation. So um, although it can be really difficult and maybe there will be um, failure, uh, it's kind of like the queer art of failure. Failure itself can actually uh, lead to other possibilities and potentialities. But I think that that is what's so key about this thinking is the, the importance of having faith in the potential for things to happen and unfold. Um, in ways that are better than the current conditions we live in. Thank you, Candice. Uh, very helpful. Uh, I see three questions. If you have questions, you can raise your virtual hand or you can just post a question or, or just say that I have a question on the chat. And if I miss any Bronwyn mic, please, please let me know. Um, Awit first, and then Julia, then Mike Borsk. Thank you, thank you, Amitava. Um, one uh, quick uh, complaint: Could you not find someone from colder weather? And Candace, could you not be weather correct? <laughs> we are, <laughs> we are in cold Kingston, and uh, you're teasing <laughs> us with Hawaiian weather. And, um, but um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed your talk. Thank you very much for joining us. I, I, my question was exactly the point that uh, Amitava. Uh, pinpointed and not not so much on the um, indigenous uh, uh, moral economy, so to speak, but more the conceptual uh, framework of capitalism and uh, this profound statements that uh, Amitabha, one of which Amitabha captured beautifully, which is um, capital fears abandons or the alibi um, of, of uh, capital is scar scarcity. Um, the, 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 the irony, capitalism, like any other uh, philosophy or whatever you call it, is full of contradictions. Um, but abundance has always been an element of capitalism, um, whether it helped capitalism itself or brought about its demise is a different story. But um, and that then brings us to the question of Abundance of what and abundance for whom. Um, this this brings back to to to, to the four the, the point that Stephen was making in terms of uh, what is abundance for whom and how do, what's the threshold for for these concepts. Right now we're talking of poverty. We're talking of famines right now in around the world or in some parts of the world. Um, but that's not for lack of uh, food. That's not for lack of wealth. Um, the, the distributory systems in the world may be problematic, but so when we're talking about poverty, can we be um, less universalist or less universalistic? I understand this is a global history conference, but um, consumerism, for example, which is the other side of capitalism is a manifestation of that abundance. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure if my question is sufficiently articulated, but 
I don't know. I'll leave it there. Yeah, um, I, I think that's a really good question. I think there is definitely a difference, though, between imaginary plenitude and an abundance that feeds. So I think consumerism promises that kind of wholeness that comes from an imaginary plenitude, but it is not always, unless everyone is full, then, you know, we just, we, we're, that is not, um, that is not true abundance. Um, so I think unless everyone is fed, that is not true abundance. Um, and I think it's precisely um, the ways that poverty is weaponized. I think that that's the thing that I'm concerned about, that if people live in a community that's been identified as um, a community below the poverty level, that is often used to degrade um, the um, degrade the lands they live on. It degrades um, their vision of the future. Um, and so I guess I'm thinking in that sense of a more specific kind of scarcity where um, scarcity itself is weaponized against people. I guess that's my concern. Um, consumerism, yeah, is that real abundance if we keep having to buy, you know, in order to to fulfill, you know, that sense of the unmet desire that capitalism creates. I think that's the, the problem. Um, and, you know, it, there's often not a space for spirituality in discussions of capitalism, uh, or maybe, the, maybe it is, maybe it is a primary <laughs> foundational conception that capitalism uh, uh, refuses to allow that kind of spirituality. Um, but I think spirituality is another kind of abundance that feeds uh, as opposed to uh, kind of like this imaginary plenitude that capitalism promises. I know that's, those are the distinctions that I'm thinking of. Um, and I, I felt, you know, I was a little concerned putting this talk together for precisely the reasons you're mentioning that poverty and scarcity take many different shapes and forms across the globe. And by comparison, maybe the people in Hawaii that I'm describing are not poor, you know, um, in that sense. So I, I wanted to be careful about that. But I guess I was more concerned about the weaponizing of poverty and how it's used to degrade lands that are currently feeding people. <laughs> So I understand. I take your I take your point about um, the the homogenizing of poverty, um, and I think that's the the reason why all of the papers that I've been looking at uh, that have been posted online that they've all been so site specific. This is what poverty means here, and this is how people articulate the conditions of their existence here. So people in Hawaii. I don't think that many of them think of themselves as living uh, in abject poverty um, because, well, I don't, I, I don't mean to speak for them, but I mean that, um, you know, you see houseless people, um, home, they call them homeless sweeps, right? The police come, they take all their belongings, yeah, and they leave them with nothing. It's just uh, amazing to to watch that, it's astonishing how they can do that without providing any alternatives for houseless people in Hawaii uh, to go to. There was at one point uh, a homeless encampment four miles long in Waianae. Four miles long, they called it Blue Tarp City. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure that, uh, that all of them would identify themselves as impoverished because they felt that they had what Puni Jackson describes, they do have, the land is, is theirs it, to steward. Yeah, not in the ownership sense, but they were able to live on the beach and catch the fish they needed and the, you know, eat the limpets and the seaweed that would sustain them. Yeah. Um, there are people living on, I, I, I think it's like $20 a week. Um, that um, there's actually a woman whose work I, I really love. Her name is uh, Kalani Opua Young. 
and she's um, a transgender woman who talks about um, living in the houseless encampments and how um, the relationships, I think that's what comes out of everything is the pilina or the relationships between the people living in the houseless encampments. That is their vai vai, that is their wealth. Um, the, the current homeless um, encampment in Waianae by the Waianae Boat Harbor has 300 families living there and they've chosen to live there. And it's a choice that they've made. Um, and I've sat with state agency, you know, admin people who say, we need to get them out of that houseless encampment and into transitional housing. But when you ask the people who live there uh, what they want, they prefer to stay living on the beach. It's not ideal, um, it's, it's difficult, but it's their source of abundance. Anyway, sorry, I can't go on and on, but because your, your question is raising all of these really important issues about people and the way they see their conditions, yeah, uh, as opposed to how state agencies diagnose their conditions for them, yeah. Thank I you, Candice. Um, <laughs> sorry. I'll, now I'll just quickly say that, uh, and don't respond because we have other questions in the line, and we, uh, but am I right in thinking about your conceptualization of abundance as a greater common good rather than an abstract thought? And if that is so, uh, defenders of capitalism might come back with the same argument that it results in greater common good, increasingly greater common good. But uh, no time for that, uh, Julia. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a really interesting point there, yes. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Professor Fujikani. I'm really glad that you could come along and um, and that we could hear your paper today. Although I'm also jealous of these pictures of Hawaii as I sit here in uh, a very blustery day in Scotland. Um, so I'm um, director of this poverty research network and also a subsidiary network on food sovereignty, which seemed very relevant to some of the topics that you were talking about in your presentation there. And I find this thesis that you've got of indigenous economies of abundance against capitalist, capitalist economies of scarcity um, really convincing and it's convincing for work that I'm doing um, with the Food Sovereignty Network on agroecological communities in Chiapas and so on. But as a historian, so I, I work actually on the early modern period and the, the relationship between colonialism and poverty in the early modern period. And I'm finding um, this thesis harder to think about in relation to that longer history of colonialism, because uh, in like sort of from the 16th and 17th centuries, Europeans were imagining indigenous communities of the new world as abundant and that was kind of one of the drivers of colonialism and even sort of when we get to classical political economy in the 18th century uh, there was an idea that you know um, higher greater population um, in Europe was creating scarcity that needed to be fixed in some ways by the new world abundance and of course a kind of interesting shift happens also in that colonial period where indigenous communities are imagined as abundant, but then they're kind of reinvented as poor and they're made poor economically. So there's kind of like, you know, this whole um, history go going on there. But um, when I think then about what it means to think about uh, indigenous abundance, it makes sense in terms of contemporary politics. But I wondered whether this kind of concept of abundance also needs decolonizing in relation to how that also abundance was weaponized um, during the long history of colonialism. Yes, I, I agree. I mean, I, I see your point about the weaponizing of abundance and, and of course, capital finds a way to weaponize everything, right? Um, but I think my, the reason why um, thinking in terms of abundance today is important is because climate change is all about the end of everything, the end of abundance, the end of um, any kind of regeneration. And what abundance holds out is the hope for regeneration in a time of climate change. So you're right in that it's a very time specific um, kind of conception of abundance. So when um, people talk about abundance, um, like in Hawaiian communities, it's about recognizing that in the names of the kalo are the indicators which kalo can grow along the shoreline because it can tolerate high le levels of salinity. So abundance in the sense that if we're going to face sea level rise, what kalo should we plant along the shorelines or, you know, um, things like that, like practical considerations, um, 
how to implement moon phases into the planting and into fishing methods to maximize on abundance. Um, and this is helpful even for us as scholars to think that there are ole moons where you don't go out fishing or you don't plant, but you take care of your equipment. So you file away your files, you do your bibliography, <laughs> right? Um, so, but in a sense that there's a proper time and for everything, and it's not an abundance that is inexhaustive. It's an abundance that comes about through careful conservation. So I think that's the difference perhaps in this period is it's an abundance that derives from an important conception of conservation. And that's what the Kanavaya Kiakua or the laws of the elements stand for, which are the conservation elements. Like we do not build a telescope above the aquifer. We do not place, you know, 186 million gallons of jet fuel or 100 feet over the aquifer that feeds Oahu. That is the current problem we're facing right now, where um, the, the U.S. military is is suing the state of Hawaii for ordering that these tanks be emptied, even though jet fuel has been found in the drinking water. They, they, I just, it's like ludicrous. It's like living in an absurd world where the United States is suing the state of Hawaii for ordering the emptying of these jet fuel tanks that are the jet fuels entering into the water supply. So um, I, I think that the abundance is qualified by the historical conditions um, in which it's being articulated, which include um, the global climate change events, which include, so when they talk about abundance and sea level rise, it's in this sense that if, you know, I've asked fish pond operators, what are you going to do when the seas inundate the fish ponds along the shorelines? And they say, then we will learn to build fish ponds inland. And whatever knowledge we gain from building fish ponds that feed us along the shoreline, we will take with us when we move inland. So it's not a wasted effort, but it's an abundance that thinks towards regeneration, not merely consumption, which I think, you know, when you're thinking about the early modern period, perhaps it was abundance in relation to consumption rather than regeneration. Thank you. That's such a great question. I love that. Contextualizing, being historically specific in contextualizing the use of conceptions of abundance. Yes. Thank you, Candice. Uh, we are out of time, but we should we can go a little beyond because there's nothing scheduled after this. Um, so, Mike, you have the last question. Jeez, big responsibility. Um, <laughs> well, well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pujikana, and I'm, I'm actually glad to be going after Awet and, and Julia, because I think one of my, my questions sort of comes to something that I know is in your book and, and wasn't so uh, prevalent in the talk, but it's about your kind of engagement with Henri Lefebvre's ideas of, of space and spatial production. And one of the things I really loved about your, your book and your talk was that these questions of uh, abundance and scarcity are always spatial concepts as much as historical concepts. Right. And I guess where I'm sort of thinking and what I was wondering if you, you wanted to comment more on is this question that I think both Albert and Julia are posing about this abundance, um, how it emerges from the three movements that Lefebvre talks about from, from the actual environment to the representations of the landscape to then the lived experience of the landscape. And it was Julia's comment that really got me thinking because of course, one of the things that happens in these colonial encounters in the 1700s is abundant land becomes wasteland. And that is how it is then rendered abundant is to denigrate it in this sort of shift. And to me, that oh. seems to mirror what Lefebvre says. And, and that's a historically contingent process, but it's also very much in keeping with the larger spatial process that he sees as, as being capitalist. And I think maybe some of these comments are suggesting might be more than capitalists or come before capitalism. And I, I think your work had such interesting things to say about that. I wondered if you wanted to finish with it. Yeah, so if, um, if mapping spatialities has to do with modes of production, then what do indigenous modes of production, what kinds of um, spatialities does that produce, right? Um, and, and so I had mentioned the Kohale system. So um, they're really cool geographers in Hawaii who asked the question, so what if markets in Hawaii were not based, uh, uh, so what if uh, communities were not 
built around markets, but were built around the production of food, how would it look differently? And I think that that's part of the kind of question you're asking. Um, and so we think about the Ahupua'a system where there was a recognition that there were different resources, or I hate to say resources because Kanaka Maoli called them family. Yeah, there are different uh, plant people who live in the mountains. There are different plant people who live in uh, the Midlands. And there are, you know, again, 21 different horizontal realms of stewardship. So that would be, okay, that would be an example of how you would conceptualize um, Kanaka Maoli um, spatiality in terms of 21 realm, horizontal realms of stewardship and each one having its own set of laws um, to protect and to conserve and to make sure that abundance can regenerate itself. So that would be, so the Ahupua'a system moves from the mountaintop to the outer edge of the reef. And everyone who lives in a particular zone is required to abide by the laws of that zone. Um, so, um, I mean, there are beautiful maps of the reefs that actually show where the fishes lived or where particular fish lived or where particular eels could be found. And the, the laws generate, uh, governing those, you can only, you know, you don't harvest um, octopus and octopus that has eggs in it or, you know, that those kinds of laws of the Akua. And that produces different conceptions of space according to the kapu or the um, the uh, whatever is forbidden, what is uh, uh, illegal to, to harvest at a particular time. I think that that sets up a different kind of relationship and, it, and an understanding of how ecologically interconnected everything is from the top of the mountain, which captures water down to the edge of the reef. So that, that I think is a difference. I, I, I love your question because it's now making me think, uh, about that as a, a different kind of organizing principle rather than one organized around markets. Uh, and actually, when you think about it, the, that kind of capitalist organization of, um, or the, the urban regional planning for Hawaii ends up having the densest populations around the shoreline, a lot of businesses, a lot of resorts right along the shoreline. And what happened was they had to cut off stream flows from the mountains to the seas so that um, uh, water was diverted for different uses. Um, and you, and it, 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 that diversion of water led to the, the deaths of estuaries um, and, um, and it prevented the concrete, the concretization of the uh, waterways to prevent flooding also prevents the, um, the, the flow of water back to the aquifers, the recharging of the aquifers. So you can see how capitalist kinds of, um, yeah, uh, economies based on, um, on relations to like harbors and airports um, and metropoles, that those things uh, had a detrimental effect on the continuities of ecological systems. I think that's why um, Kanaka Maoli's, oh, land divisions are, um, are pie-shaped or generally, not, not always, but generally pie-shaped from the mountain to the sea. That is a triangular conception of the entirety of space from the mountains to the seas. Thank you for that question. I yeah, gotta think you. more about that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Those are amazing questions. And you're really helping me think through some of the issues I need to articulate uh, more in my, in my book that I'm working on now, which is uh, Elemental Cartographies. Well, thank you, Candice. Thank you, everybody. Uh, uh, I want to end on a note of gratitude and a note of envy and gratitude because of the beautiful talk and your work and your book and for finding time to join us, uh, you know, your morning or afternoon here. I see it's almost 8 p.m. in Scotland right now, Julia. <laughs> um, but, but thank you. And we'll be in touch for further discussions on your research and um, look forward to that. And envy, because I just checked, it is 23 degrees in Honolulu right now. <laughs> 
uh, and that might be that point. Uh, Amitabha, yeah. stop it, please stop it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in pain right now. <laughs> yeah, I actually um, had friends here from uh, Stavanger University and uh, in Norway. And uh, we had a very, I got sunburned at the beach. Yeah, I was like, whoa. And this is the middle of, it's, it's still our rainy season here. You know, we don't have a cold winter, but we do have a lot of rain. But anyway, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Take care, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. And, and uh, it starts again at 9.30 tomorrow. Am I right? Um, no, sorry, 9 o'clock tomorrow. Yes, 9 o'clock with the link to be found in, of course, the uh, schedule on the website. So I hope to see everyone then. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks again. Peace. Take care. Thank you.